I take this opportunity to request all of us to raise and have our theme song, song number 373, stanza one and chorus. Choristers kindly assist us in this. and our creator what's in heaven. Thank you for this morning that you've given unto us. And even this special week that Lord you've made it for us to come closer to you. It's another moment that we are going to listen to your person that you have sent, your servant. I pray that you may inspire him and choose him in a mighty way to reach out to each one of us, Lord. We will not be the same as we peruse through your word to understand more of who you are. We are with each one of us, Lord, and even those that are not here, we will fast so that, Lord, we may join all of us in listening to your word. May your Holy Spirit be upon each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray and trust. Amen. I want to take this opportunity to welcome our speaker, Dr. Ken, to take us through the Bible study. Karibu. The Lord is good. The Lord is good and all the time. All right, uh, it's time for Bible study, and I hope you have your Bibles ready and um, everything is you. But before we start, yesterday I made a promise that today I would like to hear from the audience, from the church, from the two topics that we had in case there's a question or a comment, then we can begin our study. Is there any comment pertaining to the first study on the Holy Scripture? The second study was on um, the Trinity. Any questions, comments, reactions to the sharing in heart. Someone asked me a question yesterday outside. I uh, said he didn't know about so much about the Trinity, but he asked me that um, you say God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are all God. And they exist independently on their own. So, what if one day they disagree? What would be the fate of humanity? Imagine Jesus and God the Father, they disagree. What do you think can happen? What do you think, they, what do you think can happen if God, the three of them, they fail to agree on something? Maybe they, they, they fail to agree on, on something about us. Like, maybe that day, they, they say, we need to move the earth close to the sun, and, and the other one says, no, we're not moving it there, we, it has to be here. The other one says, no, 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 in fact, let's not talk about that. What would be the threat of humanity? What do you think you can say about that? 
Have you ever thought about it? No. What do you think can happen? Choir, what do you, what do you think can happen if God disagrees with one, if God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit disagree? What can happen? Huh? They're just murmuring. <laughs> there is no. Okay. Uh, give give the mics. Give the mics. Someone to move around with the mics. <laughs> you can start with one from the choir, and then there is another 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 person there who wants to speak. So I believe in the first place we were learning about three in one. And um, I don't believe there could be a, a disagreement because Jesus is the impression of God in flesh. Holy Spirit is the impression of God in spirit. Like I don't see how they can disagree when all are doing any given time when all of them are doing the same thing and, and actually are the same thing. I don't see any disagreement. Unless we will be trying to disintegrate them as different personalities that can sit and have different differences in understanding. Your, your, your comment has brought in another issue. So you are telling us that when Jesus was on earth, there was no God the Father. The book of John chapter 5, John chapter 5, verse 22. Let's open John 5, 22. John 5, verse 22, the Bible says, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Technically, technically what we will be having is uh, some roles, some like Jesus Christ having some different roles. Of course, there is the Father. But now we are talking of Jesus Christ as the impression of the Father in man. It gets to a point when God is commissioning his own mercy seat, the judgment seat, to the Son. What does it mean? Does it mean God, the Father, is leaving that seat to go and sit at the back and watch the Son do it? Okay. I understand what you're saying, but my question to you is, when Jesus was on earth, was there God the Father in heaven? There was. When Jesus was on earth, was there the Spirit of God in heaven? Yes, there was. So you are saying there are three distinct personalities. Yes. Well, and that's technical. <laughs> technically, technically, yes. Yes, actually, there are three distinct personalities. The, the reason why I've asked you, the, the, the statement you have said is a correct statement, okay? That, they cannot disagree. I agree there. But but you should not conclusively say that Jesus is the ex express... Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible says, Jesus is the express image of God. Like, God expressed in human form is Jesus. But Jesus exists even without the humanity in him. You get what I mean? So we, we can't we can't say that... We can't say that uh, they are oneness is based on the fact that Jesus, uh, like God, can can change form to be the Spirit and can change form to be the Father, can change form to be the Holy Spirit. I want us to understand this: that they are three things that are different. Did you get that? 
You, you understand that, right? There are three beings that are different. There is God the Father who exists independently as God the Father. When you read the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 25, the Bible tells us about the judgment. See you? And then we talk about the ancient of days, who is God the Father sitting on the throne. And as you see that God the Father sitting on the throne, the Bible tells us then that there came one like the son of who? The second of God, coming to join God the Father in the judgment, still pointing to us that these are three distinct words, personality. What I mean is, God, you can count him into one, two, and what? Do, do you all understand that point? I want us to all, this is why I say Trinity is three in one, meaning God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit coexisting together. Not that it is one God, one God who can change forms. His statement is very okay, but some of you just hearing it like that can think that there is one God who can change form. He can change today to be, today he can choose to be the son, then he changes again to be the enemy. He wanted to say something, then we move to him. That's just a question. Yes. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 says, but to the Son. Wait, 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 wait. We, let's open Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8. We all read together. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8. Yes. You can read this 8. Yes. But to the Son, he says, mm -hmm. Your throne, O God, mm -hmm. is forever and ever. Mm -hmm. A scepter of righteousness mm -hmm. is a scepter, scepter of the your kingdom. Mm -hmm. O God, to the Son, mm -hmm. he says, Your throne, O God, and then again it says, the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom, mm. addressing the Son. Who is that? Can you help us understand that? Who, who, who is addressing who? In that text. In this text, yeah. who is speaking in those words? The angel. No, it is not the angel. Uh, no, this is God. This is which, which God? God the Father. God the Father is speaking to God the Son. And he says, you, you, oh God, you, you, this, in, in, what, what we see in Hebrews chapter 1 is God affirming the divinity of Jesus Christ. You get that, That's what is happening in, in God is saying, even, even when you continue to read, it's, it's in Hebrews chapter 1, it should be verse 6. Let's go to verse 6. Hebrews chapter 1, I think it should be verse 6, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. Listen to what uh, he says. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all angels worship him. And the only being that can be worshipped is God. This is why we're saying that even God himself, God the Father, the one that the whole world agrees to be the God, addresses Jesus Christ as who? He's addressing Jesus Christ as who? As God. This is why Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 is saying, You are thrown, O God. The scepter of righteousness. And when you read verse 1, verse 1 verse, it shouldn't be the verse 3. Hebrews chapter, it's my favorite. It's my favorite. Hebrews chapter 1 verse, verse, verse 3. The Bible is saying, The Son is a radiance of God's glory. He's the express image. When you look at Jesus, this is why Jesus Christ, when he came, he affirmed himself. He said, he said, Philip, have I not stayed with you long enough that you have not seen the Father? Because when you see me, you have seen who? You have seen the Father. What Jesus Christ is saying is, everything about him, every Every attribute, this is some of the things we're going to study today. Every attribute about Jesus Christ is the same attribute that we find in God the Father. The same attribute is found in God the what? The Holy Spirit and God the Son. So there are three distinct things. Just the way you are one, two, three. That's how God is. We have God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. 
And I want to mention today this, that um, these three personalities of the Godhead does not mean, it does not mean that God the Father is more powerful than God the Son. You get what I say? It does not mean that God the Father is more powerful than the God the Son. And it does not mean that God the Holy Spirit is less powerful. Because when you go, I have preached in, in, in Presbyterian gatherings, I was told. And when you go in the, in the churches, you will find something. You will find that the way the, the, the seats in front here are different. The, the, the seat that the main speaker sits is in the middle and it is racist. Did you get what I said? It is raised it's above, and then the seat on the right is raised, but it's a bit short. And then the seat on the other side is very, very short, signifying that God the Father is the overall. And then God the Son is, he has powers, but very little powers. And then God the Holy Spirit is the least of all them. But that's not the case. The Bible tells us that they are equal. When you read Philippians chapter 2, I think verse 5, the Bible says, Jesus Christ did not call it robbery to be equal with God, but gave himself the, the, the humanity in him so that he can manifest to us his righteousness. So, so Jesus Christ, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit, they are equal. But what they agreed is that they have different roles. They have different roles pertaining to different tasks that they have. For example, in creation, they have different roles in creation. When you come to salvation, they have different roles in salvation. The Holy Spirit did not come to die, but he died in Jesus Christ. Do you get what I say? When we say God died for humankind, when we say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We are saying that God, when we are saying God is God in totality, died. Because they agreed that one of them must what? This is why when you read the Law of Ages, they say that God could not see, God the Father could not, he could not see the, the sin, that the sin by sin I mean S-C-E-N-E. He could not see the sin of God. He could not see, he could not withhold himself to see what was happening at Calvary. That was too much for him to behold. But one thing we know also is that God himself, Jesus, can God die? Can God die? Let me ask you a question. Can God die? No. Jesus Christ was, when he was here on earth, he was 100% God and 100% who? Man. But that's not what we want to study today. That's a, a topic that we'll study tomorrow. So let's not preempt it. So, we, we, we are good there, right? Uh, there was a hand there and then him. Yes. The question is, if they disagree, what will happen? Okay. Okay, can someone translate for me? Okay, you can translate. Go ahead. What? Uh -huh. God's thoughts are different from man. Yes. He wants to say this. In the book of Malachi. Let's open Malachi 2 verse 10.
Two. Verse 10. Go ahead. Matthew 2 verse 10 says so have we have we not all one father has not one God created us why do we deal treacherously uh, with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers So that's eight ten. Says so he said tomorrow. So he said tomorrow, and he said, Let it be according to your word, that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Mm -hmm. There is one God. Yeah. Mm. So, whatever makes us think or believe that that triune God can be found is our humanity. It's only our in our humanity that we believe that God can differ like humans do. So Thank you so much for the comment. There's one hand there and then another mic to the pastor. Oh, okay. Uh, I think, uh, as a pastor, I need to guide you when you go off track. Now you, the, the preacher had prepared something for us today, and we are trying to answer the same question that I tried to answer at a personal level to the person who asked the question. Now, I want to answer that question quickly, and it's true what you said. What we have here is a case we would call in theology anthropomorphism. When human beings ascribe human, fallen human beings traits to God. The only language we know here on earth is a language of a dis disagreement. And we ascribe it and we even think that God can disagree between themselves. But I gave an answer yesterday to the person who asked the question that the spirit of prophecy, even the Bible itself, and I'll give advance right now, does not envision a situation where we are postulating and discussing things which are not revealed. On this, that the Bible has been silent, Ellen Joy says there is a lot of wisdom to remain silent on that which God has not what, spoken. Are you with me? And, but whatever, if you read Deuteronomy verse 29, verse 20, 29, what does it say? The things which are revealed belong to us and to our children. Are we together? But those which are not revealed to us belong to what? To God. 
From Genesis to Revelation, we don't have even a single verse showing that God disagreed. So why are we still pushing that God would disagree when he has not revealed that? Are you with me? Let's go to the book of uh, Psalms 89. I want us to read verse 34. This is one of the reasons why it is ever emphasized by the conference. The pastor must always be present to listen to his members as they ask questions to the visitors. Are we together? So he, it is that for in the summer, my covenant I will not break. My who? I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lip. What we have here, a God who changes not. And here we are anticipating that in the eternity future, God at some point will disagree. Unless God is either a liar or we are lying to ourselves. Are we together? James 1.17 says, in him there is no shadow of turning. We don't have a God like say you have in the Quran. Who says in Quran Surah Apili that God created the earth in two days? And in Surah al it says again, God created in six days. So which God do they worship? The one who created in two days or the one who created in six days? We don't have such contradictions in the Bible. And still I see wisdom in uh, advising you that uh, let's not speculate on things that God has not revealed. So far, God does not change. If you read the book of uh, Exodus chapter 34, Beginning with verse 6, when God declares his name to Moses. Are you with me? Remember, God, long-suffering, merciful. Are you with me? Hello? And that is his nature. So there is no occurrence anywhere in the Bible, not even a single occurrence, that shows God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit disagreeing. And uh, actually all the verses we have are uh, when they are agreeing. At creation, let's make man in the form and now in our own image. Hello? Praise God. Even Jesus himself, John chapter 10 and verse 30, I and my Father are one. You don't know the, the force of the word one in that verse unless you know the Greek. Hello? Praise God. Said John 10 and verse 30, Jesus himself also testifying to his divinity. He says, I and my Father are one. Almost the same word with the same force as uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, your God is Echod. One. Echod in Hebrew means un undivided. One. Singular. Are you with me? So kindly, I would want us to put to rest this uh, debate and let us allow the teacher and Elena Kilalikon and Elena Are we together? Yes. Follow the advice. Let's be silent on what the Bible is silent and let us deliberate what has been revealed. Because, you see, the very moment you say God will disagree, you are casting aspersion to God that in the future, in a sinless world, God will disagree. And that what, the reasoning will be, that same reasoning is what we used to say that, uh, that maybe even in the new world we will disagree. Also. If God can disagree between, between their, their union, eh? are you with me? His own union of the world, the Father, the Godhead, as we call it, if they can disagree, does it, does it, it mean that in that future world we will also disagree? Because that's a, the, the logic. So kindly, let's focus on what God has revealed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor, for um, that clarification. And indeed, God cannot disagree. That's one thing. He's undivided. And I like that you quoted the Hebrew word. It's important for us to understand that the word one means it cannot be separated. It's stuck. Stuck. Our heads are bowed as we pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you because you can be revealed to us. And we ask you to reveal yourself to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, so remember we are discussing the doctrine of God. The first doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the doctrine of God. And in the doctrine of God, there are about five, if not six, beliefs from it. The first belief is the Holy Scripture, which we talked about the first day. We said the Holy Scripture is the word of the Lord that God gave, an inspired word that God brought life to it. And stored uh, his men, 40 men, all from different places over a span of 1,500 years to write and compile the Bible. And they did that. Then I also mentioned to you that there are some, some things, some books that were written earlier on that were not compiled in the Bible. Because the early Christians believed that the Bible, for a book to be included in the Bible, there were three things that they were supposed to, to follow. The first one is that there were, that, that book must, must be universally known and accepted by the Christians. That's number one. Number two, it was that the book must support the doctrines or the teachings of Jesus Christ. The book must support the doctrine and teaching of Jesus Christ. Number three, the book must support the teaching of salvation. Because if anything is not related to that, then it can be rendered useless for us. Because if it's not talking about God, if it's not talking about if it's not talking about our salvation, if it is not revealing Jesus Christ to us, then of what importance is that book to us? I'm talking this because today, even amongst the Seventh Day Adventist Church, we have a grouping that has been established that are saying that the Bible that we have is not enough. Because there are some books in the Bible that were removed. And the others who are saying that translations that we're reading today are not sufficient. I remember I had a friend, we lost him uh, just uh, towards the end of last year. His name was Amayo. He was also a medical student in UN. I remember in one of the discourses that we had somewhere, someone asked a question and he said, you know, I think the Bible is not enough. There are some things in the Bible that do not exist. So there was a very huge debate in that discussion. That boy... I, I really like that, that man. I wonder why God took him, but it's okay. Uh, he, he, he made a comment that I love. He said that the thing that God has given in the Bible, whether the translation is good or not, whether we don't support it or not, whether the verses have different things or not, but one thing that we know and we understand is that whatever has been revealed to us is sufficient for our salvation. Now let me tell you something. In, in the medical profession, for us to quantify causation, we call it the study of causation. The study of causation is you are trying to relate that this result is as of this. Like you're trying to say that COVID-19 is caused by a virus. So we say that that virus must pass through four stages. It must be adequate, it must be necessary, and it must be sufficient, and it must be, like, there must be an exact relationship, a, a cause-effect relationship that can be seen. So one thing that is so, so deep about it is that the Bible is adequate. The Bible is necessary. The Bible is sufficient. The Bible has an effect that we know because the Bible relates to history very well. There's nothing that has happened in history that is not recorded in the Bible. So the Bible is God's standard of righteousness. And we say that we must read the Bible. We must acquaint ourselves with the Bible. And then yesterday we were talking about the Trinity where we looked at the three beings that coexist together. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We say they exist as three different personalities whom they, they, they work together on tasks and purposes in creation, in redemption, in all the things matters uh, to, that, that matter to them as their God. And we say that the human mind has a limitation as to how much it can understand about God. Hello? The human mind has a limitation to how much we can understand about God because we cannot fully comprehend God. It is God himself that reveals himself to people. 
But not people understanding God. It is not possible. I mentioned to you that we as humans, we can never fully understand God. And I will repeat this because even when you're doing studies, you have to put limitations. See you? So the limitation here is that we can never, not even after reading the whole Bible, not even after memorizing the whole Bible, after memorizing all the books, even if they were to put a chip in our brains that can just read the Bible on its own, we will never understand it fully about God. God is not a concept. You get what I say? God is not a it's not a concept. It is real. When you think about God, it's not an abstract thinking because God exists and He is there. So today and the days to come, we want to break down the Trinity. We want to break it. We want to break it. And let me remind you once again that I mentioned to you that whether people call the union as Trinity or as Godhead, it matters less. Did you get that? Because we have also other, other Adventist non-Trinitarians that have risen in the church. What we know, what is important, is that there are three in one. Whatever term they used to call them, we don't care. I've also mentioned to you yesterday that of the three persons in the Godhead, the one that is understood the most is God the Father. But God the Son is less understood. God the Holy Spirit is a mystery, like people are still arguing, even as, as we are going to learn about him, you will find so many questions that people have about God, the Holy Spirit. Today we want to talk about God, the Father. And I want to remind you guys once again that the subject of God cannot be handled by men. Hello? I'm repeating this again and again, that the subject of God cannot be handled by men. It is not an easy subject to handle. We must understand the human limitations every time we are studying about God. God can only be experienced. Hello? You get what I'm saying? God can only be experienced to the ones whom he has chosen to reveal himself to him. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm saying God cannot be experienced by everyone. He can only be experienced to them whom God himself has chosen to reveal himself to him. Do you get what I'm saying? Even amongst ourselves, some of us have not experienced him because he has not revealed himself to us. But I want to show you some things here that um, God reveals himself through attributes. And when we talk about an attribute, we're talking about a quality that is intrinsic or a quality that is internal, a quality that one bears and that quality identifies that someone because it is a unique quality. When you're, write, when you're writing your CV uh, to apply for a job, they ask you, what are your attributes? What are your attributes? What are your attributes? How can you be identified? You get what I say? How can you be identified? So attributes are the only way we can know who God is. So I'll show you how those attributes come to play. But before I do that, I want us to know also that God can reveal himself through the attributes and also God can reveal himself through three ways. Theologians have agreed that there are only three ways in which God can reveal himself. The first one is through creation. God can reveal himself. God the Father reveals himself through what? He reveals himself through what? Creation. So how does God the Father reveal himself creation? The Bible tells us that it is only through creation that we can see who God is, we can see the wisdom of God, we can see the power that Jesus, uh, that God the Father has. By looking at the natural world, the things that he has created, we'll be able to know who God is. Let's read from Romans chapter 1. Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. Romans 1, verse 20. Are you there? Say amen if you're there. Romans 1 verse 20. Are you there? The Bible says, For since the creation of the world, the, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities 
want to clarify there, we can say since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes. We can say that since the creation of the world, God's invisible characteristics. So the Bible is saying, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal powers. Now the Bible is saying that invisible qualities, then dash. You know that, what does that dash mean? When does that dash to a statement? You're connecting two statements together. Still. So it's saying, His eternal powers, His divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. The Bible is saying that when you look at creation, when you consider the things that God has created, we have not a, we have no excuse but to believe in God who exists. Hello? Do you get what I said? Creation declares who God is. Verse 21. The Bible says, For although they knew God, I love this one. Listen to it. It says, For although they knew God, they never glorified him as, as God, nor gave thanks to him. But thinking became but their thinking became such out, and their foolish hearts were darkened. What the Bible is saying is, even after God has revealed himself through creation, we have not given thanks. We have not recognized him as who? We have not recognized him as who? As God. And by that, God has allowed our hearts to be darkened because we don't listen, because we can't confess him. Even the apostles, the disciples of Jesus Christ, had a problem to accept the divinity of Jesus Christ. It is only at the certain point that I will preach during the sermon that they accepted one very far away. All in doing all this calling and all that, they only accepted once about the divinity of Jesus Christ. So when, when we deny the existence of God, even after revealing himself in the creation, God darkens our hearts. Because that's a choice that we have made. Observing the nature, we discern, let me tell you, by looking at the nature and creation, we don't see everything about God. We see some things. We gain some knowledge about God. Do you see another limitation there? Do you see another limitation? Creation declares who God is, but that's not everything about God. That's not everything about God. It's super intelligent. That's what you can see in creation. That he is powerful beyond all human understanding. That he can be the greatest designer. And he created the universe in a spectacular way, a magnificent way. That not even the architects of this world can design the world the way Jesus Christ. The world, the way, the, the, the way God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit revealed it. Psalms 19, verse 1. Are you there? Psalms 19 verse 1. Psalms 19 verse 1. The Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of who? The glory of God. And the skies proclaim the works of his words. His hand. This is why when God was having a conversation with Job, this is why he, he redirected him. He said, Were you there when I read the foundation of the earth? Job chapter 8. Job, do you know the distance between the sky and the earth? Job was just confused. Man, I have balls here. I have skin disease. You want me to be concerned? Yes. Job, were you there when, when I was putting the hair in the head? Were you there? Were you there when I created the earth? Do you know how deep the deepest place in the ocean? Do you know how deep that distance is? Job was just amazed because God can be revealed in the creation. Psalms 104, verse 24. Psalms 
receiving the creatures beyond the numbering of all the things. It is God that made them. Psalms number 8, verse 4. Psalms number 8, verse 4. Psalms 8, verse 4. The Bible is saying, read. Psalms 108, yes. verse 4. The Bible says, uh, freedom no, that's from verse 3. Start from the, verse 3. Verse 3. Yes. I will praise you, O Lord. I will praise you, O Lord. Among the peoples. Yes. And I will sing praises to you among the nations. Yes. For your mercy is great. Psalms about eight. Psalms 8, verse 4. Psalms 8, Psalms 8, verse 4. 4. Yes. What, a, what is man? Verse 4. You're reading this. Yeah, verse 3, sorry, go to verse 3. It says, When I consider when I consider uh -huh. your heavens, mm -hmm. the work of your finger, mm -hmm. the moon and the stars, mm -hmm. which you have ordained, mm -hmm. what is man that you are mindful of him? When you consider all the things that God has made, we are just but nothingness in the creation of God. Imagine we were even created on the sixth day. <laughs> We just we a drop in the ocean like when you consider the greatness of Jesus Christ, the greatness of God the Father in creation, you can't even think about man because God is so big and so huge. That's what the psalmist is saying. So I'm saying today that God reveals himself through creation. If you were to tell me to handle health, I would have told you something about negative ions. Negative ions and health. That sometimes we just need to go. There's a way that even God connects with us through the nature. One read steps to Christ. Ellen White is saying, when 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 you are walking in in, in, in in the bushes, in the jungles, and you consider how flowers bloom, when you consider how 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 a seed can grow into a big plant, a whole big tree, man. Even science cannot fully explain those things. Because the mastermind is God. He also reveals himself in a special revelation. So, point number one, he reveals himself in creation. The point number one is he reveals himself in attributes. Point number two, he reveals himself in creation. Point number three, in special revelation. God has revealed himself in special revelation. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible tells us that God in various times, in the past times, in sundry times, depending on the version you're reading, has spoken to us through the what? Through the what? The prophets. God spoke to us in the time past through the prophets. How do prophets know that God has spoken to them? When you read 2 Peter, Chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible tells us that God gives the prophecy to the prophets. God reveals himself to the prophets. In other words, the Bible is telling us that prophecy does not come by the will of man. And I remember discussing with you that when we talk about prophecy, we are talking about not only a, a foretell of the future events. But we're also talking about the message that God gives. When you look at the Hebrew word, prophetia, it is telling us that it is an inspired word. So the inspired word can come as an instruction. The inspired word can come as a foretell of future events. But what we know is that God reveals himself through the word. The Bible is a special revelation of Jesus Christ and God the Father. Amen? God reveals himself in the Bible. If you want to know who God the Father is, you go to the what? You go to the what? To the Bible. Because it is through the word, a special revelation, that God reveals himself. When you read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible is telling us that the Holy Scripture is the true revelation. Paul, in writing to Timothy, is telling him that do not forget these things, the sacred things that you have been taught from your childhood, that reveal about God himself, and they give wisdom about his salvation. So if you want to know about God, you can know him through his word. We know about God the Father which is a mystery that has never been understood. Theologians have written research papers about it, but they cannot, they didn't understand it. Even Sister White could not fully say everything about it. Let me tell you, the incarnation of God. The 
incarnation of God is the, is the fourth way in which God reveals himself. You know, incarnation is a subject that even pastor cannot explain. I cannot explain. If you were to call the GC president, Pastor Chad Wilson, to come, he cannot explain. It is a mystery that God can become man. That, that is a mystery that is beyond what human beings can explain. That God can become man. Imagine a mother becoming a daughter of, his, of her own daughter. An impossibility. Nicodemus, one of the preachers of the law, he said it is impossible. It is impossible for man to be born again, to be born again in his mother's womb. It is impossible. How? How? When me, I'm, I'm a medical scientist. I can tell you that for a baby to be born, there must be fertilization. Senor, there must be fertilization. The egg of the mom and, 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 and the, 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 the sperm of the father must fertilize for a child to be born. But Jesus Christ, there was no process of fertilization. He just went himself into the mother's womb. Science cannot even explain. When, when, when we reach there, we disagree with a lot of people. This is why even Muslims don't believe in Jesus Christ. Because how? How do you explain such a mystery? How? How? God reveals himself in the incarnation. The Bible tells us in the book, Hebrews chapter 1, that God has spoken to us in these last days through his word, through his son, and that son is Jesus Christ. So, he is the express image of God. When you look at Jesus Christ, you are looking at God the Father. Amen? When you see Jesus Christ, he is the express image. He is the radiance of the glory of God. When you want to see what God's glory is all about, you see Jesus. The incarnated God. Jesus Christ. The image of God. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17, that it is by him and for him that the world were what? created. The incarnated God. To understand God, we must understand also his attributes. So I've given you four ways. Now I want to go back to the first one. The first one I've said, God reveals himself through his attributes, his parities or characteristics. The second one, I've said, God the Father reveals himself in creation. I've also said, God the Father reveals himself through the scripture by special revelation. And the third one, I've said, the fourth one, I've said, God the Father reveals himself through the incarnated Christ. Because Christ said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now I want to talk about God revealing himself through attributes. Attributes are distinct qualities that describe a human being. Hello? I am corruptible. That is my attributes. I can die. That is, that is what describes humanity. I am made by God. That is describing humanity. There are characteristics or intrinsic or eternal, internal, not eternal, but internal things that no one else possess, but only one person must possess because those things can be used to describe that person. For example, you can, you can differentiate between uh, this table, this color, and this color. See you? There, there are things about this color that you can say that are not on this jacket. So special characteristics that we have about God. And I want to tell you today that these attributes can be in two forms. And I will show you the two forms. The first form is incommunicable attributes. Incommunicable. Incommunicable from the word communication. Incommunicable attributes. When we talk about incommunicable attributes, being a medical profession, I want to show you that we talk about communicable diseases and uncommunicable diseases. You have ever heard about communicable diseases? Communicable diseases are diseases that are contagious, that you can pass on to another person. Hello? Did you hear what I said? Give me an example of a communicable disease. Huh? Flu, flu, yes, flu. Another one? Huh? Scabies. Scabies, very good. HIV, very good. Those are communicable diseases, right? And then are there uncommunicable diseases? Give me an example of an uncommunicable disease. 
attention. If I sit with you and I have COVID-19, I will pass the COVID-19 to you. It's a contagious. It's a contagion. A disease that can be passed out. And then if I have hypertension, sitting with you cannot give you hypertension. You get what I say? So, there are some attributes about God that are incommunicable. It means these are special attributes that even after saving us, we cannot have those attributes. Do you get what I say? Do you, do you get what I say? We should not have those attributes. And then there are attributes or characteristics of God that are communicable, which can be transpassed, which can be given out. For example, when Jesus reflects his glory on us, we change our characters. We, can, we become holy and pure. And that purity is not our purity. It's the purity of who? Of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you are going to the disease, that is the disease of who? That's given to us. You get what I say? Communicable attributes and incommunicable what? attributes. So let's go to the incommunicable attributes. One of the incommunicable attributes that identifies God the Father is that God the Father is infinity. There is infinity. It means God has no end. He cannot be terminated. He was there in the beginning. He is there now. He was there. Not, God was not there in the beginning. But he was there before the beginning began. Do you get what I say? Because God has no beginning. So when, when, when human beings started counting their beginning, God already existed. I thought you say amen. So he's infinity. You can read that from 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. Allow me, we're not going to read the text again because of time, so that I, I can just go through it. You read it at your time. So just be at, at your pen and paper to write the verses that I'm mentioning. So God is without end. That's 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. You can also find that in Acts of Apostles chapter 17, verse 24. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, and Acts of Apostles chapter 17, verse 24. The second attribute is that God is eternal. God is what? Eternal. Eternity is what identifies God. When you talk about eternity, we don't mean endless. Endless is infinity. Eternity, eternity means he has no succession in time. Did you get what I said? Did you get what I said? There is no succession to time. God just exists. There is no succession to time. You will not say, ah, yesterday he was there, and then today he has disappeared. There is no succession to time when you talk about God. Where can you get that? You can read that from the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verse 23. You can also read that from Psalms 90, verse 2. The other thing is, God is immutable. Immutability is a characteristic of God. When you talk about immutability, we are saying that God cannot change. Amen? Our God can never change. If you go to science, then you can say God is not a variable. You know what a variable is? It's, it's something that changes. It can change. Age can change. Weight can change. Those are variables. But our God cannot change. God does not grow. <laughs> God does not grow. God does, if the Bible says God is ancient of days, it means he has been ancient of days since and he will remain like that. God cannot change. And some say that God changed in Christ. Come, there is a subject about Christ that we're going to talk about tomorrow. They say God changed in Christ. I will show you that God never changed. God does not change. He's immutable. You can read that from James chapter 1, verse 17. He is omnipresent. God is omnipresent. It means God is everywhere. Amen? Where you are, God is there. Where they are, God is there. In prison, God is there. Everywhere, God is there. Psalms 139, verse 7 to 12. God is everywhere. God is omniscience. It means God is all-knowing. He has knowledge of the actual things that exist. God knows everything. He knows, God knows everything. This is why, if you remember, I have told you that God can never be surprised of anything. There is nothing that can surprise God. Like, God doesn't go like, wow. There is never a time God will go like, wow. He, he, he knows everything. He has full knowledge. But that's another thing also. Because from the doctrine of understanding God also, some have brought in an issue of predestination. 
and they have brought in the issue of 144,000. That only these ones are the ones that God knows that they're going to be saved. But that's something that we can discuss later. I see my time is going to an end. God is also omnipotent. Omnipotence means God is all powerful. Amen? God is all powerful. The other thing is, God is sovereign. God is the supreme ruler of all things, above all kings, above all thrones, above all kingdoms, exists a God whose throne is above all things. So I reach if I say that I ascend above the throne of God. And then there are communicable attributes of God. The communicable attributes of God are attributes that we can testify, the things that we can see and talk about. The first thing is that God is a unity God. God is a unity God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. A God of justice. A God of justice. It means God is no respecter of persons. God does not look at someone as a president. He looks at us the same way. And when you come to the cross, it even makes the things better. Because at the cross, God defines us in two ways. Sinner saved by grace or sinner condemned because they didn't receive the light. Two things on God is a God of moral equity. He divides blessings in the way that we need them. He doesn't give blessings anyhow, but he gives us based on the needs that we have. A God of love. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. A God of truth. John 14, 6. A God of freedom. Isaiah 40, verse 13 to 14. A God of holiness. Righteousness only exists in God. And the Bible tells us that there is none that existed who is righteous except God the Watch. The Father. John 1, verse 5. 1 John 1. Verse 5. Yet such a God reveals himself to humankind and man understands him through the communicable attributes. He can also be revealed as God the Redeemer. God the Father is our refuge, the psalmist say. God the Father is our salvation and our vengeance, uh, the psalmist says. God the Father is our creator. God the Father is the father of all the fathers. That one is a beautiful one. God the Father is the Father of all the fathers, such that if you lose the Father, you have a Father in God. So, mankind cannot understand the God we are talking about. It is impossible for us to fully comprehend God. We cannot comprehend God. We are limited in our thinking. We are limited in our understanding. But the things that have been revealed to us, are the things that we must hold on by faith. And I want to tell you today that there are many who believe in God in different forms. But one thing remains unique about our God, that God the Father, creator of God, that God the Father is a special God for you and me, and that God the Father incarnated for you and me to be saved. May the good Lord bless us as we continue with our camp meeting. Let us pray. Lord, Understanding you is hard. Talking about you is hard. We often make mistakes when we talk about you because we're talking about you in a language that cannot describe you. There is no vocabulary that can be put forward to explain fully who you are. Human beings have tried to explain you as infinite God, but that is not enough. Others have said you are omnipotent. That is not enough. Omnipresent, omniscient. All those are not enough. But we Praise you, because through our limitation, you still accept our praise. Now I want to thank you and ask you to continue revealing yourself to us, because you have said only to those whom you have revealed yourself to are the ones that understand fully who you are. May your grace fall upon us as we continue with our deliberations in Jesus' name. Amen.